Okay, welcome back everyone to Grockett's OG TV. This is the GMAT edition, um, not the SAT or the ACT or any of the other editions. We're going through the 12th edition of the official guide to the test. My name is Jim Jacobson, and last time we left off with, uh, we finished with question number 206 on page 181. We're in the problem solving section, getting to the end of that. And this time we are turning the page to page 182. Um, and do it starting with question 207. So page 182, question 207. And we have some answer choices as always. 15, 10, 7. I guess the nice thing is once I get to um, data sufficiency, I won't have to write down answer choices. So, you know, lucky me, I guess. Um, okay. For the past n days, the average daily production at a company was 50 units. If today's production of 90 units raises the average to 55 units per day, what is the value of n? So we have a couple different equations here, and of course one important, one important formula for the GMAT for you on test day that you really won't be able to succeed without is that the average of something, and I know I say this every time, but I can't assume that everyone watch ever, watches every episode, um, average equals the uh, sum of the numbers that you're adding up divided by the total, well, I should probably write number of numbers that you're adding up. And we have two separate averages in this one. We know that uh, the average of 50 is equal to that sum of their productions on various days. And we know that that's divided by um, n number of days. So the sum of all their productions divided by the n number of days equals 50. We also know that on one day, uh, they get an average of 55, which was equal to that sum, that same sum of all the production, plus an additional 90. Because um, that was the so it was the sum of all the previous days plus ninety on you know what was it yesterday? Oh today. <laughs> if today's production was ninety, um, it's the sum of all the days leading up to today, then ninety for today, and the number of days is n plus one more for today. So we have two equations here, and from here we should be able to solve for our n. Um, first thing to do is realize that we can solve for this guy here, the sum of the production thing, and then substitute it over here. So first off, let's solve for that sum. Um, what do we call it? Let's call it P. So um, 50 equals the production over the number. So that production, we'd multiply both sides times N. So P for the production equals 50N. We can then substitute that over in this equation here. We get 55 equals 50n plus 90 over n plus 1. Multiply both sides times n plus 1. We get 55n plus 55 equals 50n plus 90. We'll subtract 50n from both sides, so we get 5n plus 55 equals 90, and then subtract 55 from both sides. So um, n, well, we get 5n equals 35, and n equals 7. Answer choice E. So over seven days that they had their production of 50 units each. I was about to say, do you have any questions? But I have no way of hearing whether you have questions. So uh, I don't know what to tell you. Sorry. Um, I suppose you could write in, uh, send me a message on Grocket saying, hey, I have a question about this thing that you said. Um, my, I think actually the page that has the, uh, well, it has my name, and you can certainly look me up on Grocket. I'm under the instructor's uh, tutors. Anyway, on to number. Uh, 208. So 182, number 208. And we have some complicated answer choices. 
x plus 1 over x minus 1 quantity squared. We have x minus 1 over x plus 1 quantity squared. We have x squared plus 1 over 1 minus x squared. We have x squared minus 1 over x squared plus 1. And last but not least, the opposite of x minus 1 over x plus 1 quantity squared. Goodness gracious. OK. So if x is not equal to 0 and x is not equal to 1, and if x is replaced by 1 over x everywhere in the expression above, then the resulting expression is equivalent to what? So the expression above, let's just get that up there, is x plus 1 over x minus 1 quantity squared. And so we need to replace um, every x in there with its reciprocal, 1 over x. So let's just do that and see what it looks like. So 1 over x plus 1 over 1 over x minus 1 quantity squared. Now to get rid of those x's in the denominators and make our lives easier, um, we can internally, within the parentheses, so it's actually going to look like, I'll write it out just to make things clear, 1 plus x over 1 over, <laughs> multiply this times x over x. Remember, when you multiply anything times the same thing in the numerator and the denominator, you're really just multiplying it times 1, you know, 1 over 1, negative 2 over negative 2, and yet you can still use this to get rid of things in um, denominators in overly complicated fractions. The only thing it doesn't work for is 0 over 0, but why would you want to do that anyway? So we're actually doing this quantity squared. So 1 over x plus 1 quantity times x kind of changes where the x is. x times 1 over x equals 1. Let's put this over here. We have 1 plus x, because x times 1 is x. x times 1 over x, as we established, is 1. And then negative 1 times x is negative x. So we have that quantity squared. As our bad luck would have it, that's not one of the answer choices, even though we know our math is correct. So clearly we need to do some additional uh, figuring here. So uh, this particular question, first off, let's get the x's first, because in basically all the answer choices, x is first. So this is really x plus 1 over um, negative x plus 1 quantity squared, which again is not one of the answer choices. Um, so what we can do here, though, is um, realize that what we're dealing with here is something squared. So what we can do is say, um, once again, this is the same thing as negative 1 times x plus 1, oops, I didn't mean to put that there, over x minus 1. So the negative 1 is, is, can only reverse one of the numerator and the denominator. Uh, in this particular case, the negative 1 is reversing the denominator because we went from basically 1 minus x, or you know, negative x plus 1. Negative 1 times that returns it to um, x minus 1. And this whole thing, quantity squared. Now, the so that's really then, we can just get rid of the um, negative 1. That's the opposite of um, x plus 1 over x minus 1 quantity squared, um, which is then the same thing as x plus 1 times x minus 1 quantity squared, because remember that um, x squared equals the same thing as the opposite of x squared. 
um, negative numbers when raised to even exponents become positive again. So the opposite of x plus 1 over x minus 1 is the same thing as x plus 1 over minus 1 when that quantity is squared in both cases. So a little bit of a trick on this one in converting it to a form recognizable by our answer choices, but um, that's the way the GMAT works. So anyway, we shall move on. So 182, number 209. So we have 230, 250, 260, 270, and 290. In the figure above, if z equals 50, then x plus y equals what? So we have a figure above. Let us draw a figure. Yikes. Okay. And then we have something like that. So we have z there, we have y there, and x is this guy here. And let's change color. So we find out from the problem that z equals 50. Oops, I forgot something. Forgot something kind of key here, actually. This is a right angle, and this is a right angle. All right, so z equals 50. We know that this angle equals 50. What we can also tell from the diagram is that because um, both, uh, uh, I'll stick with the red, since this line here and this line here are both right angles to this baseline here, these two lines are parallel. which in turn means that the, um, this angle, that angle Z and the complement of angle Y both equal 50. Um, both of these angles then, um, because they're, they are the similar angles with a, a line that is transverse to parallel lines, these two have the same measure. So that, that gets us partway there. We also then realize that um, this section here with y and angle 50, these two angles form a 180 degree line. So y will equal y equals 180 minus 50, so y equals 130. We'll get that in there. We can also figure out then what the complement of angle x is. So, you know, x plus this other angle equal 180. And we know what two of the three angles are in this smaller triangle because uh, we have the right angle here which is 90 and we have the other angle already which is 50 so um, so we have 50 plus 90 plus the complement of x equals 180. So you know, that equals 140 plus the complement therefore that complement is 40 degrees and if you're following along of course x plus that complement equals 180 so back to this equation here so x itself equals Wait, did I? No, that's not right. <laughs> the complement equals 40, so x equals 140. Now, of course, the question isn't asking us that. It's actually asking us what x plus y is. We determined that y equals 130, so 130 plus 140 equals 270. Answer choice D. And on to the next column. So page 182, question 210. We have 2x minus 3y equals 6. 2x plus 3y 
equals 6, 3x plus 2y equals 6, uh, 2x minus 3y equals negative 6, and 3x minus 2y equals negative 6. So in the coordinate system above, which of the following is the equation of line L? Another diagram. You guys sick of my drawing yet? Okay. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. So the line goes from here to there. So one, two, three, one, two. Okay, a couple of key things that we need to know then uh, for this particular question. First off is um, the slope-intercept form of any equation for a line. Um, that form is y equals mx plus b. Another thing to have tattooed on your arm if that were legal to tattoo things on your arm for the GMAT. Um, so y equals mx plus b, where y is the y-coordinate, um, m equals the slope, and b equals the y-intercept, the point at which the line crosses the y-axis. Slope itself has its own little formula. Um, the slope of a line is equal to the, this is what my uh, high school algebra teacher he would always say, rise over run. Um, so rise over run, which is the same thing as, you know, change in y over change in x, however you want to think about it. Um, so uh, if we can figure out the slope of the line and the equation for the line, uh, we can figure out then which of the answer choices could also be the equation for the line. Clearly the answer choices are not given in slope-intercept form. None of them are y equals anything x plus some other constant, but um, you know perhaps our answer will start to look more familiar when we get our equation in slope-intercept form. So back to slope-intercept form, we have y equals mx plus b, that's an x. We know that the y-intercept is 2, so that's pretty good. So y equals mx plus 2. Um, we can also figure out the slope. Um, the, the slope here is rise over run. The, the line goes down 2 because it starts at 2, or excuse me, 0, 2 up here and goes down to 3, 0 here. We can figure out the slope from that. So the change in, uh, in y um, is goes down 2. The change in x is it goes over 3. So the slope is negative 2 thirds. So our line equation is y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 2. Well, of course, none of our answer choices have that. So um, our first step is going to be getting rid of the fraction in our equation for the line here. Um, to get rid of the fraction, we get rid of the denominator. So we multiply the whole equation by 3. So multiply that whole thing times 3, we get 3y. We multiply negative 2 thirds x times 3, we get negative 2x. And then we multiply 2 by 3, and we get 6. Um, we then also need to, so even, even without finishing the answer choices, we can get rid of any answer choices that don't have 3y in them. So we can get rid of answer choice e uh, or answer choice c. Uh, because those have 2y. We can add 2x to both sides and we get 3y plus 2x equals 6, which is just another ordering of 2x plus 3y equals 6, which is answer choice B. And so we have completed this one. And we move on to one that does not have a diagram, which is a nice change.
So 182, number 211. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So if a two-digit positive integer has its digits reversed, the resulting integer differs from the original by 27. By how much do the two digits differ? So again, our good variables to use when we're talking about digits of a number, especially two-digit two digit ones, we can have t equal that tens digit, and u equal the units digit. We aren't necessarily going to have to differentiate between the two on this one, but it does help keep them straight when we're constructing our equation. So we have a two-digit positive integer. Um, the, the value of that integer, when we figure it out, would be 10 times that tens digit plus just the units digit. Okay. And we are then subtracting. So the difference between these two when the, when the digits are reversed is 27. So if we subtract the other, the reverse of that number, which would be 10 times the units digit plus then just the tens digit, the difference between these two numbers, uh, th this is the reversal of the digits, that equals 27. So then this is the same thing as 10t plus u minus 10u uh, minus t, because uh, minus a positive that makes it a negative, equals 27. We can simplify this. 10t minus 1t equals 9t. Um, uh, u minus 10u equals 9u. Um, that equals 27. So uh, t minus u, we divide everything by 9, equals 3. So the difference between the two digits, which is what the question is actually asking, it says, by how much do the two digits differ? Um, the difference between them is 3. Answer choice A. And now we move on to another one with a diagram. So 182, number 212. So we have k, k over the square root of 2, k over the square root of 3, k over 2, and k over 3. So the circle with center c shown above is tangent to both axes. If the distance from o to c is equal to k, what is the radius of the circle in terms of k? Diagram time. probably should have drawn the circle first. Good enough. Anyway, centers at C. Um, o is our origin, x axis. That's an x really, y axis. Okay, um, it's tangent to both axes. If the distance from zero to C is equal to k, what is the radius of the circle in terms of k? So, um, sorry, distance from O to C. So what that's telling us um, is this right here, let me put that in red, whoops. So that right there is K. We also know then that this distance here, since it's tangent, this is the radius, uh, I'll put that in a different color. This distance here is the radius, as is this distance here. So now it's starting to look more like a triangle. Um, and we can use the Pythagorean theorem then to figure out k, where k is the hypotenuse of a right triangle, because this is a right angle and this is a right angle and it's in fact a square. So k is the um, diagonal of a square with side length r. So the Pythagorean tells us, Pythagorean theorem, and well actually further analysis tells us that if this is r and if this is r up here, 
then this is also r and this is r here. Okay, so uh, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. Remember that's uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where those are the side lengths of the sides and the hypotenuse respectively of a right triangle. So r squared plus the other side is also a radius equals c squared. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, equals k. We need to have it equal k squared. So we end up with um, 2r squared equals k squared. Um, we divide both sides by 2. r squared equals k squared divided by 2. And then we take the square root of that because we need to find r. We're trying to find r in terms of k r equals then the square root of k squared over 2. We can rewrite that as the square root of k squared over the square root of 2. And the square root of k squared will, of course, equal k. So we end up with k over the square root of 2, which is r, which is answer choice b. And we move on. Next page, page 183. Top of the page, number 213. We have x times y. We have x plus y. We have 1 over x plus y. We have xy over x plus y. And we have x plus y over xy. So in an electric circuit, two resistors with resistances x and y are connected in parallel. In this case, if r is the combined resistance of these two resistors, then the reciprocal of r is equal to the sum of the reciprocals of x and y. What is r in terms of x and y? So let's actually just get that second bit there. It says the reciprocal of r, 1 over r, equals the sum of the reciprocals of x and y. And if you've been following my broadcasts at all, this is actually going to look uh, pretty familiar. This is actually the same thing as what happens when you're deriving the work formula, when you have two machines that are um, uh, both producing or doing something at different rates, and you're trying to figure out um, how fast they can do a job when uh, both machines are working in conjunction, where you take the reciprocals of the, each of the values, and that equals the reciprocal of the time, and blah, blah, blah. So it's the same thing. Um, you're finding, and, so, and if you don't remember, that's okay. I'll explain it here. Um, basically, we need to find a common denominator. So the common denominator of um, 1 over x and 1 over y is x times y. So 1 over r is equal to uh, y over x times y. So we multiplied each of these. Um, we multiplied this guy times y over y and multiplied this guy times x over x because multiplying something times that same thing over itself is the same as multiplying it times 1, but it's converting the fraction just as you would convert you know, the common denominator of 1 third and 1 half this one would be, you multiply this guy times 2 over 2 and this guy times 3 over 3 to get, you know, 2 sixths plus 3 sixths. Anyway, we're doing that same thing here. We get y over x times y plus x over x times y. 1 over r equals x plus y over x times y. Flip it over, r equals x times y over x plus y, which is the same as the work formula in a different context. Anyway, uh, that's answer choice D. Yay. Okay. So on to number 214, 183, number 214. Have eleven eighths, seven eighths, nine sixty fourths, five six 
60 fourths and three 60 fourths. So Xavier, Yvonne, and Zelda each try independently to solve a problem. If their individual probabilities for success are one fourth, one half, and five eighths respectively, what is the probability that Xavier and Yvonne, but not Zelda, will solve the problem? So really they just gave us names to go with X, Y, and Z here. So um, their probabilities are respectively one fourth, uh, one half, and five eighths for solving this mysterious problem. Um, However, we're not trying to figure out what the probability is of all of them solving the problem. We need the first two of them. We need x and y to solve the problem, but not z. So remember, probability, two things you need to know. Probability equals the desired outcomes over the uh, total outcomes. And also, um, that 1 minus um, the probability of what you don't want um, let's let's call it uh, oh I don't even <laughs> probability not wanted so because these are always expressed as a fraction um, the probability of what you don't want plus the probability of what you do want equals one so if you have if it's easier to figure out or you already know the probability of what you don't want to happen, 1 minus that equals the uh, wanted probability. The reason this matters is that uh, we need to actually figure out the probability of Zelda not figuring it out. So probability fractions of several events, and you're, when you're trying to figure out what the probability is of all of those things happening, you multiply their probability fractions together. So if we wanted to find out what the chances were of all of these things happening, we would multiply 1 fourth times 1 half times 5 eighths, and that would be the chance of all three of them getting it right. Um, but that's not what we need. We actually, and what does that end up being? That ends up being 5 sixty fourths. Uh, which is our trap answer, answer choice D. We, however, need Zelda not to get it right. So um, the probability of Xavier getting it right is 1 in 4, which we were given. Probability of Yvonne getting it right is 1 half. The probability of Zelda getting it wrong is 1 minus the probability of her getting it right. So 1 minus 5 eighths equals the wanted probability of 3 eighths. So this is yes, yes, no. So then we end up with 3 64ths. Answer choice E. Okay, on to number 215. 183, 215, 0, negative 1 negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. So if 1 over x minus 1 over the quantity x plus 1 equals 1 over the quantity x plus 4, then x could be. So that's one thing to pay attention to. When you get one of those questions, x could be, you know that you're going to get one, you're going to get more than one value, more than one possible value for x. So, I mean, we just sort of know that in advance, the normal way that happens. Uh, is with inequalities and with uh, quadratic equations where you end up with um, two values for x. So one of those things is going to happen here, probably. Uh, 1 over x equals, no sorry, 1 over x minus 1 over x plus 1 equals 1 over x plus 4. All these fractions, we can't just flip them, we actually need to find a common denominator when you lack any other ideas for a common denominator, uh, the one sure bet, that's not always the best one, but the sure bet is to multiply the three, um, in this case, three bases, the three denominators together. That is your common denominator. So our common denominator is going to be x times x plus 1 times x plus 4. 
and in that case, um, we can um, then multiply. Then each of the numerators of these will be uh, the product of whichever two of these three do not appear in the denominator originally. So that means that, for example, this will be x plus one times x plus four over our common denominator of um, x times x plus one times x plus four. Um, and minus, um, sorry, x times uh, x plus four over x times x plus one, x plus four equals x times x plus one over that same common denominator Okay, so which then means um, that um, we end up with, uh, we can multiply the whole thing times that uh, common denominator again. So we get x plus one times x plus four minus x times x plus four equals x times x plus one. Oh, sorry, wait, I did that wrong. Forget that. We end up with the, no, actually that's right, I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't have crossed that out. Um, I'll rewrite it, x plus one, x plus four, minus x times x plus four equals x times x plus one. So we can factor out the x plus four, x plus four, that's x plus one there, times x plus one minus x equals x times x plus one. Um, x plus one minus x, x plus one minus x just equals one, so one times x plus four, we end up with x plus four equals x squared plus one. Um, times plus x, oh my goodness, this problem is not going well for me. Anyway, um, we can subtract an x from both sides. We have x plus four on one side, x squared, or x squared plus x on the other side. We end up with x squared equals four. So x equals negative two or two. We only have one of those two. It's answer choice C. Oh my goodness. I did not do that problem as well as I wanted to. Anyway, hopefully that's clear. Um, if not, try watching it again, or yeah, the explanation is also in the back of the book. Okay, anyway. I'm ready to move on. Page 183, question number 216. Uh, one half to the negative 48th power. We have one half to the negative 11th power. Uh, one half to the negative sixth. One eighth to the negative 11th and 1 eighth to the negative sixth. And we have an initial expression here. Um, 1 half to the negative third times 1 fourth to the negative 2 times 1 16th to the negative 1 equals some other thing. So let's just rewrite that up here. 1 half to the negative 3 times 1 fourth to the negative 2 um, and times one sixteenth to the negative one equals something. So it's probably easiest to turn these into, um, well, 
really, it's not even easiest. Uh, it's the only way you can solve this is if the exponents have a common base. Um, in this particular case, all the bases are powers of one half. So uh, by reducing them all to um, having the base of one half, we can make our life easier. So one half to the negative third is going to stay one half to the negative third. That's a three. One fourth to the negative third is the same thing as um, one half squared to the negative two. And remember, when you raise exponents to exponents, you multiply them together. So two times negative two, I should have written this down further. I'm going to move it down here, sorry. First one stays one half to the negative three. The second one, one quarter to the negative two is the same thing as one half squared to the negative two, which then gives us our base of one half. Um, and then this one's to the negative fourth, because when you raise exponents to exponents, like, you know, x to the a to the b equals x to the a times b. Um, so this one is one half to the negative fourth. Uh, this one here is uh, one half um, to the fourth power to the negative one power. So this one also equals one half to the negative fourth. Now when you have exponents of the same bases and you are multiplying them together, you add the exponents together. So um, this is the same thing as one half to the negative three plus negative four plus negative four, which equals one half to the negative eleventh power. Answer choice B. Number 217 on 183. Five four three two zero. Five four three two zero. So in a certain game, a large container is filled with red, yellow, green, and blue beads worth respectively seven, five, three, and two points each. A number of beads are then removed from the container. If the product of the point values of the removed beads is 147,000, how many red beads were removed? That's actually kind of a lame game. I don't, I don't think anybody would actually play that, but um, you never know. Anyway, one of the things to notice, so we have, let's just get these point values down. We have um, red beads, uh, yellow beads, green beads, and blue beads, which are worth seven, five, three, and two points respectively. The thing to notice immediately is that all of these are prime numbers. So, um, and your score in this game is the product, apparently, of all of the point values of the beads that you draw. So um, what, we're, what we're basically asked to do here is find out the prime factorization of 147,000 points. Um, whenever possible, you want to get um, your, do your prime factor. So we could divide by two a whole bunch of times, um, but um, it's better if we can kind of divide by some other, get some of the bigger prime factors out. So this is the same thing as 1,000 times 147, you know, because 147,000. Um, and this question is actually asking how many red beads were removed. 10,000, or excuse me, 1,000 does not have seven as any of its prime factors. So even though there'd be more, you know, this would tree down for a bit, um, we don't actually care about any of them because seven doesn't go into uh, 1,000 at all. We only care about the red beads. 147, is 7 times um, 21. 21 is in turn uh, 7 times 3. So in fact there have only been two, uh, so 7 is uh, a prime factor twice in 147,000, so there were only two red beads drawn for this particular problem. Ta-da! Answer choice D. Uh, 
Uh, so, number 218, last one on page 183, number 218. So we have negative two. Come on. I don't know what happened there. Negative two, every once in a while it just stops, um, you know, accepting the fact that I have a tablet. So I apologize for the minor technical glitch of that little box where answer choice A should be. Okay, so if 2 over the quantity 1 plus 2 over y equals 1, then y equals what? So this is a straightforward uh, solution question where we have to just do some algebra. 2 over 1 plus 2 over y equals 1. First thing we want to do is get rid of that fraction. So we multiply both sides times the quantity 1 plus 2 over y. So that gets rid of it in the denominator here. That ends up equaling then 2 equals 1 times 1 plus 2 over y, which is the same thing as 1 plus 2 over y. We can subtract uh, 1 from both sides. 2 over y equals 1. Now the only thing that you can have in the denominator here, now I suppose if you just didn't recognize it, you could multiply both sides times y, where you get y equals 2, or you could immediately recognize that the only way you can get 2 over something to equal 1 is if that denominator is also 2. So y equals 2. Answer choice D. And with that, we move on to the next page. The last pair of pages actually in the problem solving section. I want to try and uh, get rid of that box. Okay, so page 184, new page, question 219. Okay, so this is statement one, statement two, one and two. Forgive me for not writing out the entire answer. I'm assuming you have the book in front of you. Uh, two and three and one, two and three. So if a, b, and c are consecutive positive integers and a is less than b is less than c, which of the following must be true? Statement one, C minus A equals two. Statement two, A, B, C is even. And statement three, A plus B plus C divided by three is an integer. The strategy with Roman numeral statements uh, is twofold. One, of course, is to start with whatever is easiest. Um, you know, whichever, whichever statement looks like the easiest one, if you can prove or disprove it, you can eliminate answer choices just based on that one. The other thing to do is to choose, um, if they all look equally easy or hard, choose the one that appears the most times in the answer choices, and because then you'll be able to eliminate or uh, accept more answer choices on that basis. In this particular one, I, I mean, it's not particularly important. Or you can also just do them in order. I mean, um, it's not that important. In this one, uh, it looks like statement one appears three times, statement two appears three times, and statement three appears twice. So let's just do one and two first and go from there. So we have A, B, and C are consecutive, and um, A is less than B is less than C. So, um, if they're consecutive, that means that they are incremented by one. Um, consecutive positive integers, so it could be, you know, three, four, five, or, you know, 74, 75, 76, or anything like that. Um, we know that they're consecutive and positive. So by definition, um, C, the third one in the sequence, is always going to be two more than A. That's, that's part of the definition of being consecutive. So C minus A equals 2. This one must be true. So on that basis alone, we can eliminate answer, answer choice B uh, and D because they don't include statement 1. 
statement two, a, b, c is even. So if we have three consecutive integers, um, whether it's three, four, five, where it's um, odd, even, odd, or 74, 75, 76, where it's even, odd, even, we have at least one even number no matter what with three consecutive integers. And one of the number properties that is absolutely mission critical for you on the GMAT for memorizing and for just knowing and understanding um, is that an even number times anything, well, any other, an even integer times any other integer times anything itself is going to be an even number. So because at least one, if not two, of a, b, and c are even, no matter whether we start with an odd or an even number, that whole product, a times b times c, is by definition also even, or by number properties also even. So of course that actually doesn't eliminate anything else. We probably, um, well, we can eliminate answer choice a. Um, I guess it might have been smarter to jump to, no, I guess it wouldn't have. I was just looking at, in terms of strategy, whether we should have looked at statement three next. But it, it's not really that important because we still would have had two answer choices left no matter what. Okay, so statement one and statement two must be true. Now we just have to determine statement three. So a plus b plus c divided by three is an integer. Um, so really, a plus b plus c over three, that's the same thing as the average of, of uh, three numbers. Um, so now, it's not the case that the average of any three integers would automatically um, be an integer. Uh, so, you know, if we had three integers that were like, you know, two, two, and three, the average would not be an integer. However, we know that they are three consecutive numbers. Again, we have, they're numbers like three, four, five, or 74, 75, 76. The average of any three consecutive integers is the middle one because um, you have the number itself, and then the number on either side is one more and one less. So even without doing the math, um, we already knew that, that b in the sequence a, b, c, uh, we already knew that b was an integer, and since we're just taking the average of the three, it's going to be the middle one. So answer or statement number three also must be true, which means answer choice e um, must be the correct answer. Hmm. I'm just trying to decide whether we can get one more in. Um, no, I think I think we'll stop there um, just to make sure that we have enough time. Uh, and I got off to a little bit of a late start, so I want to make sure that I'm done on time in the event there is programming immediately after this. So um, I apologize for that extra minute or so that I was a little bit off. Anyway, so we got up through question number 219, like it says right there. Next time we'll pick up with question 220 on page 184. It looks like we will finish problem solving next time. How many more? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We have 11 problems left in problem solving, and then we'll move on to data sufficiency next time. Um, unless these remaining problems just take so long that they take the full session. In any case, we will finish problem solving next time, so I'll see you then.